if I'd stayed on the trajectory that I was on in my in my 20s, I wouldn't even be here. There's no doubt in my mind that I would not have lived as long as I have now. We need to provide people with solid biblical teaching about the positive aspects of human sexuality as well as how to overcome the struggles that we face in that area. But I really never understood that that Christianity was not just about uh, doing th certain things and following certain rules. It was about a relationship, a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the difference of having the Holy Spirit inside of me versus just being a kid that grew up in a Christian home and knew all the things not to do and failed all the time at doing them. It really arose during the, the early 60s in terms of concern about the direction of the church and um, and seeing things that were pointing the church in the wrong direction. Think about Harvard and Yale and some of the institutions that were founded and formed in such rich biblical tradition and uh, the, the teachings of scripture. How do these institutions like a church, like the United Methodist Church or, or other denominations that kind of wound up forming into that, how do we get so far away? The Methodist Church in America started with about a dozen pastors and grew from nothing really in 1780 to uh, become the fastest growing denomination and by the by 1880 were the largest of any Christian denomination in the United States. We're talking about and what Wesley was talking about was a level of accountability and a level of knowing each other and asking the hard questions that goes way beyond that most small groups are doing. When these kinds of small groups and bands fell into disuse in the late 1800s, that's when the denomination really lost its spiritual strength. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of the Love and Truth Network podcast. And whether you're coming to us through Love and Truth Network directly or through Transforming Congregations, we're just glad that you're here. And we pray that this time will be encouraging to you, that it will be uplifting to you and informative. And we would just also encourage you to pass along these podcasts to people that you know. Uh, we encourage you to su subscribe yourself, whether you're listening to the podcast or you're viewing those, and make sure that you pass around uh, the information that we're here and the topics that we're talking about, certainly in our day and age, are essential topics that, that Christians uh, need to be uh, encouraged by and uplifted by and equipped with. And so again, we're glad that you're here. And I'm also glad to introduce you to someone who's been my boss for almost the last nine years and for the for the part-time role that I've had. Melissa and I founded Love and Truth Network back in 2013, but I was asked in 2016, and some of you know this already, but 2016 to take over the part-time uh, directorship of Transforming Congregation. And Transforming Congregations has traditionally been a, a renewal uh, program, a renewal ministry within the United Methodist Church, and it's been under the purview of Good News for many, many years. And uh, Tom uh, Lambrick has worked for Good News for, I'll let him tell you the the, the dates and the, and the exact times, but um, he's been my boss as the operations uh, head as the vice president of Good News. And just grateful that you're here with us, Tom. And um, you can correct any of the misinformation I just put out there about uh, your role or whatever, but we're glad that you're here. And um, just grateful that you've, you've been, I've been connected with you for these last nine years as well in ministry. Well, thanks, Gary. It really is amazing that it's been that long. It doesn't seem like it, um, but it's been a great, fruitful relationship. And uh, we're so excited that Transforming Congregations has been a part of Good News um, for a number of years um, in two different stints and um, that, yes. that we've been able to uh, support that important ministry because I think it's a, a key aspect of, of the work that we've been doing in Renewal. Well, and usually we're going to we're going to shift in just a moment for you to share some of your story with our listening or viewing audience and uh, they're accustomed to that and we love the stories of how God has has brought people to faith whether that's out of a lot of brokenness and obvious whether it's been addiction or other things or those stories that where some people feel like I don't even feel like I have much of a story because I didn't get involved in all kinds of craziness when I was younger but the truth is I often say to these folks that say that th that is a profound story because if growing up in our culture, 
today, certainly, but even a number of decades ago, to not get caught up in all of the things that the world offers and not get lured away by the enemy or the world, um, our own flesh, into some of those places is a huge testament, I think, to the grace of God and the mercy of God. And, and also for the fact that people that you don't have to have gone through all of the mess to, to be a vibrant uh, walking partner with somebody who has. Yes, it's great when we have people who can understand the places that we've come out of, and that there is a benefit to that. But so many times we kind of think, oh, those are the only people that can relate to us. But but that's not true. The truth is when we are aware of our own tendency toward brokenness, our own tendency toward failure, that um, it doesn't matter who we are or what we've come out of, we can still be a powerful, uh, again, walking partner, encourager, spiritual father, older brother, older mother, sister, whatever, that um, that walks alongside of people in their brokenness. But before we even kind of shift to you you sharing a little bit about that, I would love just for you to, uh, to talk a tiny bit about, or a little bit about um, the connection of transforming congregations and good news and, and kind of what's happening now. I mean, our audience knows from me a little bit about the, trans, uh, the transfer of transforming congregations from Good News to Love and Truth Network. But from your perspective, what does that look like? And what's the value of transforming congregations, not just kind of remaining the the kind of the size and the focus it has been, but even expanding um, in, the, in the months and years to come? Well, as I look at the ministry of transforming congregations, um, it's important because uh, we need to provide people with solid biblical teaching about the positive aspects of human sexuality, as mm-hmm. well as how to overcome the struggles that we face in that area. Um, Good News and, and other renewal groups, both within the United Methodism, as well as Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopalian, uh, have also always uh, stood uh, for the biblical position that uh, sexuality is for marriage between one man and one woman. But oftentimes we get caught up in the kind of uh, legal and, and uh, denominational battles that um, focus on rules and laws and things like that and, you know, what you can't do. And, and uh, it's important, I think it was important for Good News to also provide a positive ministry yes. that counteracts or counterweights that, balances it. Um, that, that provides uh, a uh, biblical and yet compassionate and um, transformative way for people to engage issues of sexuality, not just LGBT issues, but um, all issues of sexual brokenness. Yep. Um, you know, you have certainly said this before, and I believe it, that there's probably more heterosexual brokenness in the world than there is uh, homosexuality. And so, you know, there's it's a universal need for ministry. And so that was what motivated Good News to really come alongside transforming congregations. Actually, back in the mid 90s uh, was my first uh, time serving on the transforming congregations board and and uh, being a support there and and helping to incorporate uh, transforming congregations into the work that we are doing in renewal and to support it financially along the way as well. And yes. um, to to give greater visibility to the ministry uh, has been our goal, and, and that's been an important aspect of Good News' work. I'm also excited about uh, the fact that, that be, even though Good News is going away, uh, because we believe we've accomplished the, the mission that God's given us, that transforming congregations will continue because the need is still there. It's greater now than it ever has been. And... Um, Uh, It's exciting to have transforming congregations well positioned to move into a a fruitful future of ministry um, with Love and Truth Network as a partnership and reaching both um, evangelical congregations as well as Wesleyan Methodists of uh, varying stripes uh, across the spectrum. Um, This is not a a Calvinist Arminian kind of deal. Uh, We all struggle and this is all for all of us, an area of need and, and um, an area of ministry. So I'm, I'm excited about the future of transforming congregations. Well, I think that's incredibly well said, and and I just have to echo w- one of the things you mentioned is certainly uh, good news has given us a platform, transforming congregations, uh, a platform to 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 share about the the value. I often talk about the idea that 
in, in dealing with many of these issues of human sexuality and identity, we can really get pretty squeamish about those topics. But the truth, or at least feel like, well, I know this is true from an orthodox perspective. I know it's true, but it doesn't sound like very good news. But the the reality is it's incredibly good news. And also we as Christians, whether you come out of a background like mine, out of the LGBT world and my wife, or you come out, you don't deal with those things at all. The reality that we live in a in a world, in a time, in a culture where sexual brokenness just saturates so much within the broader culture, but also so much within the church, um, that that having a, a ministry like this, where people can be equipped to deal with these issues, both with, and I know these sound like words that you wouldn't associate with this kind of ministry, but joy and confidence, like seeing people's lives changed and transformed, seeing, I have zero doubt that if I'd stayed on the trajectory that I was on in my, in my twenties, I, I don't, I wouldn't even be here. There's no doubt in my mind that I would not have lived as long as I have now. And not only just existing, but for God to so come in and change and shift something that felt like it was immutable and impossible to change to where Melissa and I just celebrated our 17th year of marriage, where I get to be a dad to the, to our boys. And, and I, I just can't believe how God has been so abundantly loving and merciful and gracious in my life and in the life of so many others that come out of this space. I'm so grateful that I didn't settle for and that, and that God put believers around me that believed in the more he had for me, didn't just pat me on the head and say, well, this is kind of as good as it gets. You you can have your boyfriend, you can have your husband. God's totally fine with that. That would have been one message that's going out today. But another message would be, well, you can't really act on those things, but you can identify with those things, but you just can't act on them. And yeah, life is going to be pretty miserable until the day you die and go home to be with Jesus. And I just, I'm so grateful that while the journey has been hard, hardest thing I've ever done to come out of that world and and follow Jesus out of that space. But it has also been one of the most worthwhile things I've ever engaged in. So I love how Good News and Transforming Congregations, it has a long history way prior to my involvement with it, has maintained truth, but also done it in such a way that it, it, it communicates such incredible hope. But speaking of that hope, I would love for you, Tom, to share with our listeners and viewers a little bit of your own story and, and just what what Jesus has done in your life, what life looked like prior to that, what life has looked like um, in following Christ um, after salvation. Sure. Well, I'm happy to do that. Um, um, I grew up in a, a religious home. Uh, my parents were Methodists. Um, my grandfather was a, a Methodist pastor. And um, so we were in church every Sunday, Sunday school, uh, even youth group at times uh, involved. Uh, but in our case, it was more, mostly a, a kind of a thing. This is what you're supposed to do. You do it, did it because you went. You went because you were supposed to. Um, there were times we we critiqued the service and the sermon and all that kind of thing, but it really didn't um, impact our daily lives. I would say, um, I had meaningful experiences with the Lord. Even during that time, I can remember Sunday school times, uh, teachers that, you know, tried to lead us into a closer relationship with Christ. I can remember confirmation being a, um, a big experience for me and feeling God's presence in that. But I really never understood that that Christianity was not just about uh, doing th certain things and following certain rules. It was about a relationship, a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I didn't really understand that until uh, my mom started going to a charismatic women's organization called Women's Aglow. Mm -hmm. And um, as she went to that, she uh, basically got converted uh, in that kind of relational Christianity and understood much deeper uh, what Christianity was all about and um, kind of led my dad along in that journey. And then she, um, throughout her life after that, was continually working on people to get them to understand that and to respond, sometimes obnoxiously so. Uh, <laughs> but but she, um, she saw to it that uh, we went to a um, rally in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I grew up, 
um, where the, the keynote speaker was Terry Ann Mewson, who was uh, a former Miss America mm. and um, um, uh, devoted Christian. And so she shared her testimony about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and what that was like. And that was the first time really I'd ever heard of that message. And so I was in college at the time, and um, I, I had some friends that were part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship uh, chapter on our campus, and um, I uh, invited one of my friends for a walk and asked her the question, what does it mean to have Jesus as Lord of your life? Hmm. And after she got up off the pavement, um, she tried to explain what it was like for her and what it meant to, to follow Jesus. And in response to that, I went home and invited Jesus into my heart and, and turned my life over to him. And um, my life has been focused on him ever since, really. Mm. Um, I can't say that it, it made dramatic changes in my life. I think more uh, dramatic changes in my heart. Uh, motivation, um, desires mm. um, changed. I Before that, I, I would say I was somewhat combative um, in terms of my personality. I would argue with people at the drop of a hat. And um, after that, it changed. I, I wasn't so argumentative. I can still carry on an argument, but it's, it's from a different perspective now yes. and um, much more designed for listening and influence rather than winning an argument. And so that was probably the most significant change, but just all my, my goals and motivations changed and, and helped me to be the kind of person that, that um, is growing more and more like Christ every day. That's, mm -hmm. that's the goal. Well, I, I love how you shared that and, and what you kind of highlighted there, because I think it can sometimes be challenging when when someone has not had some long history of all kinds of kind of crazy living and then comes to faith, like there's there's not a ton maybe of, of outer behavioral changes, but the fact that you're so keenly aware of the the heart changes, the motivation and things of that nature, that... And, and really, that reminds me about Jesus talking about the need for the inside of the cup to be cleaned, not just the outside, you know, of the, of the cup mm -hmm. to be cleaned. And Rob, and, Rob Renfro and I were talking uh, in an earlier podcast episode that has not been released yet. We were talking about um, that, that kind of, you know, that very thing where there are so many people sitting in churches who have a form of Christianity, um, but, but don't have the real life in them and not even recognizing that. And I think that, you know, from when I finally gave my life to Christ at 23 years of age, out of a ton of confusion and brokenness and, and great, great emotional angst and you know, addiction and all kinds of things, it was the, the difference of, of having the Holy Spirit inside of me versus just being a kid that grew up in a Christian home and knew all the things not to do and failed all the time at doing them. But the difference of having the Holy Spirit inside was so starkly different. But really what you're describing too is a stark difference. It just didn't maybe look maybe as obvious on the outside as maybe what it looked like for me but you definitely had a keen sense of an internal shift and change at the heart level, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was certainly not the perfect person before that. Um, yeah. In fact, you know, uh, I discovered alcohol in college and mm -hmm. um, that my parents were uh, totally uh, believing in abstinence from alcohol. And so we never experienced any of that. In yeah. fact, they were very negative about it. And, um, but my friends and fellow students in college, that was one of the things we did. And yep. so there were times when I would go get drunk and mm -hmm. um, experience that. Um, I could have gotten hooked on alcohol, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so God rescued me from that possibility by uh, my conversion experience. But yep. um, but certainly uh, it, that that's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that as well. I... Um, I would love to, we were talking a little bit already about good news and transforming congregations. You mentioned earlier, and I, just for those who might not have caught the podcast with um, Rob and, and me, Rob Renfro, the 
you mentioned that good news is going away and transforming congregations. The ministry that I, I lead and direct is, is still existing. And if anything, for sure, it's, it's growing in nature is what we believe God is leading us into. But when you talk about good news going away, I, I just want to make sure that people understand that really the, the purpose of good news has really been fulfilled in the launch of the global Methodist church. And maybe there are some other ways of, of wording that, um, in, a, in either a better way, or maybe there's some other things that have been fulfilled, but it really isn't the, it's been, it's a closing down because of really fulfillment. Um, I think, could you kind of, uh, elucidate that a little bit more? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, Good News has been around for 57 years, Hmm. and our purpose has always been to bring about scriptural renewal to the United Methodist Church. Um, We sensed, uh, well, not me because I wasn't a part of it, but the the earliest people uh, sensed the need for a recovery of biblical orthodoxy and Wesleyan teaching within the United Methodist Church and um, spoke up for that and advocated for it and worked for that uh, for these 57 years. Mm. Um, and, and we uh, believe that, that we had hoped that the United Methodist Church as a denomination would respond to that message and would um, come to recover our historic Wesleyan uh, Orthodox Christian doctrine. Um, however, in the last 10 years or more, it's become pretty apparent that that's not what they want to do, the leadership of that denomination. And so um, we ended up uh, with a situation where those of us who who felt it was essential to recover that uh, decided to break away uh, from the United Methodist Church and establish something new. We've called it the Global Methodist Church. Um, and its intention is really to uh, promote scriptural Christianity and holiness and personal holiness and um, social holiness. Um, and that's that's our goal within the Global Methodist Church. And um, there are lots of reasons for that separation that took place. Um, the presenting issue, obviously, was disagreements about homosexuality, um, the acceptability of homosexuality, whether we can do gay marriages and stuff like that. But really, it was a much deeper uh, theological divide Mm -hmm. that I think precipitated the the separation. But um, in the in the process of that, we believe that that the mission of good news for recovery of Wesleyan Orthodox Christianity has been fulfilled within the Global Methodist Church. Got it. And the door is really closed in the United Methodist Church uh, Mm -hmm. for any uh, continued kind of promotion of that. Um, we continue to hear stories even today um, from Orthodox uh, Wesleyan pastors within the United Methodist Church who are being um, persecuted, um, brought up on false accusations, uh, even to the point of being forced out of the denomination. Hmm. And, um, and that you know just betrays the fact that the United Methodist Church has chosen a direction, yeah. and it's not... It's not Wesleyan biblical Christianity. It's a different kind of understanding of the faith. Yep. And so um, the door is really closed for good news to try to do anything within the United Methodist Church. And there's no need for us to bring renewal to the global Methodist Church because it really is embodying what we're all about. Yes. So yes. that has brought us to the point where we, we acknowledge that it's time for us to end our mission, our end our work, because uh, the mission's been accomplished. And... Um, so we, we would rather devote our energy to building the Global Methodist Church, and that's, that's where we are pouring our energy at the time. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for explaining that. You know, I um, in, in saying that, though, people might think, well, so if good news is going away, why isn't transforming congregations going away as well? And, and just to explain that, and you can add thoughts to that as well, that transforming congregations has been under good news for many years now, but coming out from under and, and coming underneath of Love and Truth Network. And we really do believe as, as a leadership team in Love and Truth Network that we want transforming congregations to continue to have a particular emphasis in, certainly in the global Methodist church, but um, certainly for 
Orthodox individuals and pastors or any congregation still in the UMC that are are desiring uh, support or ministry or encouragement. And and we want to see TC broaden beyond those particular denominations into more of a pan-Wesleyan, uh, in, into Methodism, Wesleyanism in other denominations as well. But the reason that we certainly believe that we want to have a primary focus in this new Global Methodist Church is is the reality that every single person uh, on the planet is both an emotional, uh, spiritual, but also sexual being, and and in order and living in the culture particularly that we're in now, I think it's always been necessary for us to have a uh, robust biblical understanding of of identity, biblical under uh, identity as well as human sexuality and and God's design for us in those um, in those spaces and what marriage was intended by God to be about. And, um, and, and that marriage is the container by which um, sexual activity is the one place that that's blessed. And, and there's reasons for why that is. But the reason TC is continuing and, um, and actually growing and expanding is because our particular message around not just <clears throat> LGBTQ, but the broader issue of, of sexual brokenness in the heterosexual space too, is a message that the, the church just needs to be equipped in, um, uh, in this particular cultural moment that we're in, for sure. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, as I said before, it's, it's something that everybody needs. And yep. the, the, the evangelical world is more attuned toward a, a Calvinist understanding of the faith. And that's perfectly fine. I disagree with it, but it, it's, a, it's a, val- a valid Christian interpretation. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I think Love and Truth Network has really zeroed in on that aspect. But um, there's a whole other uh, type of Christianity out there with a Wesleyan understanding of the faith. And yep. um, that needs to be reached as well. And yes. so transforming congregations is, it has been, and is our effort to do that. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, I appreciate you saying, sharing it that way too. One of the things I meant to follow up with Rob about is that I know that good news was formed in 1967, but but I did not recall until he was talking about it, and then I forgot to loop back to it, that the United Methodist Church specifically was actually formed in 1968, right? And so how how did, I'm curious about how, and you might, you might not know all the details, but how it is that Good News was formed a year earlier than the United Methodist Church was formed. Well, uh, the United Methodist Church came about as a result of a merger between pre-existing denominations. Um, the Methodist Church uh, in in America started in 1784, and and it went through um, lots of uh, separations in the 1800s, uh, including one over slavery that resulted in the, the Church North and the Church South, um, and and some of those came back together in 1939. And at the same time, there were um, two denominations started that were Methodist in nature, but they spoke German. Uh, they were basically German immigrants, the Evangelical Church and the, the United Brethren Church. And um, those denominations got together in the 1940s. And so the, they all, all both Methodists and Evangelical United Brethren, believe the same things. Um, and, and it was only their past history of different languages that kept them apart. And mm. so in 1968, those denominations came together to form the United Methodist Church. And so um, the good news really arose out of a movement of pastors and uh, lay leaders within the Methodist Church. And um, it really arose during the the early 60s in terms of concern about the direction of the church Mm -hmm. and, um, and seeing things that were pointing the church in the wrong direction. And, and so in 1966, um, Charles Kaiser, who was a, a Methodist pastor at the time, wrote a, an article in the denominational clergy magazine that was very influential and, and impacted a lot of people, got a lot of feedback, probably the most feedback of any article that was ever written in that magazine. Hmm. And um, in response to the, the feedback, uh, Chuck Kaiser decided to start a a movement, an organization to promote uh, Orthodox biblical Christianity. And so that's how Good News came to be formed. And it just coincidentally happened in 1967 as the denominations were in the process of merging together. 
but certainly uh, the need was there across the board. Mm-hmm. Well, it was so interesting a couple of days ago to <clears throat> to be in uh, Texas and to join uh, you and the the staff of Good News and uh, the board of Good News just to to have a final meeting and dinner and uh, to hear many of those stories that I to that point had not even known. And you you just touched on a little bit of it with Chuck Kaiser and some of the the origins of Good News. So again, thanks for sharing that. But one of the other things that occurs to me, um, Tom, is is thinking about like how I, I think about Harvard and Yale and some of the institutions that were founded and formed in such rich biblical tradition and uh, the the teachings of scripture and theology coming right out of the out of the Bible and and then thinking about just the the Wesleyan doctrine and uh, what John Wesley Charles Wesley I mean how, how is it that I just love your thoughts about how do these institutions like a church, like the United Methodist Church or or other denominations that kind of wound up forming into that, how do we get so far away to to a place that we're not even, it's not even like we're neutral, but it shifts into a, um, really the celebration of things that are absolutely, you know, sinful and broken and uh, that I know we're, we're all sinners and I, I get all that, but what are your thoughts about the shifts of these enormous institutions into places that are so far removed from where they once um, uh, were. Well, you know, Gary, it's interesting that that a lot of these institutions were founded from a very strong faith uh, Christian background and and foundation. I think that uh, you know you've often heard that that the devil can't really create anything; he only counterfeits what God That's does. Right. And um, and that I think is true in the in the sense that it is godly people who end up starting things like this. Um, the Methodist Church in America started with about a dozen pastors, who and and some of them were not even ordained, um, and and grew from nothing really in 1780 to uh, become the fastest growing denomination, and by the by. 1880 were the largest Protestant denomination, well, the largest of any Christian denomination in the United States, um, and and had a, a very powerful influence uh, in society as well as in the, the leaders of the country, uh, Congress and presidents who were Methodist. Uh, in fact, Prohibition was largely a Methodist project. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the outlawing of alcohol was a crusade that really started in the Methodist Church and broadened from there. So it was a very strong and influential denomination. Of course, Satan attempts to corrupt uh, institutions that are fruitful and making a difference. Yes. And so uh, what happened was that um, in in the 1800s in Europe, uh, Christianity began to die theologically as people came up with um, kind of new scientific approaches to the Christian faith and understanding the Bible that, that, um, that really nullified the miraculous and nullified uh, the reality of Christ's uh, miracles, uh, his death, his resurrection, um, the, the ability for sins to be forgiven, uh, the future in heaven. A lot of those things were called into question by theologians in Europe and, you know, I think one of the problems is when a, deno- when a denomination or institution becomes highly respected, it tends to want to maintain that high respect. Mm. And it, all, it often um, tends to look to the world's opinion of what that looks like. And so um, in order to stay up with what was the latest thing, uh, uh, Methodist um, Teachers in the U.S. in seminaries were trained in Europe and imbibed this this very liberal, very um, anti supernaturalist understanding of Christianity, and brought it back with them to the seminaries in the U.S. and trained pastors in this way. And that was the beginning of the corruption of uh, the Methodist movement. Um, I think the same thing happens in, in colleges and seminaries and in universities and right. other institutions. People adopt whatever the latest thing is in order to be respected and be well thought of by the society. And we take our eye off the ball. We, we put our eyes on, on 
the things of this world instead of our accountability to the audience of one. And that's why we got off track and um, it can lead to a very um, damaging and, and painful decline. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. And we're certainly seeing that in so many institutions and, and, and what you just described, I think about uh, the UMC as an example is, is uh, well thought out. The, um, I'm wondering too, Tom, just to, to shift a little bit about the, you know, we, we talked a little bit about history and, and Rob and I did some of that too, of the UMC and the uh, good news and transforming <clears throat> congregations. What do you see, um, you and I and, and a number of people that I know and lots that I don't from around the world were at the, um, the general conference in Costa Rica, the convening conference for the uh, Global Methodist Church. And, and certainly, and I've been to two other uh, general conferences within the, the UMC, and I've got to say, the vibe and the experience was radically different. It was so, so wonderful to not have the, the tension um, and the kind of, you know, bracing for whatever um, at, at the, uh, the GMC convening conference. But it, it, was a, it was a joyful time. It was a beautiful time. I was exhibiting, so I was at my table a lot. I wasn't in the sessions as much as, as I have been in the past. But what's, the, what's the, your perspective? I know you were serving, I think, as a general secretary for the conference. Uh, what, what is your perspective and, the, and others in terms of the hopes for what the, the Global Methodist Church is going to be in the near future and, and maybe off a ways um, you know, in the next 10, 20, whatever years? Well, the focus of the Global Methodist Church is really on holiness and righteousness, righteousness before God. Um, that, w I mean, you earlier talked about the, the difference that Christ can make in our life. And, and we believe in a transformative God, Yes, a God who transforms life. He doesn't just like put up with the life the way it is and, and help us through it. He, and you know, there are times when he doesn't change life, but there are many times when he transforms it completely. And yes. um, the God that we love and serve is a God who changes things for the better. And um, his goal is that we all become like Christ. I mean, Christ is the example for us of how to live, and um, we can't do it. Um, and so he puts the Holy Spirit within us, as you mentioned, and enables us then to live out our faith in a real uh, powerful way. And we become a different person from the inside out. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of transformation that needs to happen. One of the, the vehicles for that kind of transformation is accountability, that we be accountable to one another uh, for our walk of discipleship. That kind of piggybacks on what uh, Transforming Congregations has found in terms of helping people to come out of sexual brokenness, that accountability is one of the, the main features of that. But even apart from coming out of any kind of addiction or brokenness, just coming out of the human condition of sin requires accountability. And so this was Wesley's genius idea was to have um, small groups that met on a weekly basis and provided support, encouragement, and accountability for the members. And that's really the focus of the Global Methodist Church moving forward is to recover uh, that practice of small group accountability and, and support. And um, that's the, the pathway of discipleship, really. Jesus and the 12 disciples, that's what they did. Yes. They had small group meetings every day and uh, engaged in ministry together and held each other accountable and grew and, and, and learned. Yep, yep. So, well, so that's, really, that's really the focus of, mm -hmm. of the Global Methodist Church, and it's a, counter, a counterweight to the uh, United Methodist Church's renouncing of accountability. Um, one of the, the precipitating factors of the separation was the fact that that leaders in the church and and um, uh, large groups in the church decided to no longer be accountable to the church's polity and rules and doctrine, and decided to make up whatever they wanted at the time. And yep. so um, we we learned by painful experience the the ravages that lack of accountability can uh, can mean for a denomination, for a church, for a congregation. And, you know, so accountability is, is really key. 
yeah. uh, as we move forward in the Global Methodist Church. And out of that accountability comes a sense of unity of purpose, a unity of mission, a uh, unity of doctrine, um, a submission to the will of God, and, and really enables us to focus on promoting God's mission in the world, which is transformation, again, yes. um, transforming people into the likeness of Christ. Yep. Um, making disciples of Jesus Christ who continue to grow in that relationship and become more and more like Jesus. And that's really the focus. Well, and I loved when I came into my role at Transforming Congregations and didn't really have much, a lot of experience um, with the United Methodist Church. And But to, to at some point be exposed to the uh, what you just talked about wesley's idea of bands uh for f a few men a few women together you know going uh, being accountable to one another i was just so blessed by that because i've been talking about for years that that we're missing this idea of bands of brothers bands of sisters and i would often verbalize it that way and i and literally when i say bands of brothers i'm thinking of the hbo series that came out the war series that came out many you know probably decades ago now that that when you're in that kind of a battle together when you are just trying to keep uh your your brother alive you're trying to keep others alive and they're trying to keep you alive we miss the fact that we are in uh, a spiritual battle very much of the same magnitude, maybe more so because you're dealing with eternal life here, and and that we we do need to be closely connected. And and lest people misunderstand, uh, you know, th they might say, "Oh, I have a small group, or I have a men's group, or I have a women's group." But what we're talking about, and what Wesley was talking about, was a level of accountability and a level of knowing each other and asking the hard questions that goes way beyond what most men's groups, what most women, I'm not saying all, but most small groups are doing. Many small groups, men's groups, women's groups are doing Bible studies and book studies. And th there's value to all of that, obviously, a Bible study. But but many times we we use those to avoid the deeper stuff within us that we are so ashamed of or we're wrestling with or a uh, an addictive pattern that we're still dealing with or underneath the weight of and i love how i mean wesley was was forming these groups and these bands of brothers have such a rich heritage within the united methodist church but also i i've rather than simply calling them accountability groups, I prefer relational accountability because it's, I, I want people who are growing in relationship, who have a heart connection to, to my walk with the Lord and my, uh, my increased and in growing, um, movement further into holiness and further into sanctification that that it's not just sometimes i've been in some accountability that feels like someone's just kind of grabbing a clipboard and going down the list of things the naughty things i shouldn't be doing that you know checking to see whether i've done them we're not talking about that but we are talking about asking the hard questions but that it's really about this also this relational component that is the the gel that that where our brothers matter to us, whereas women, our sisters matter to us. And I think that I love that that has such a rich history within um, uh, Wesleyan uh, uh, theology. Well, that was really the engine that drove the, the gr church's growth. Um, yeah. And uh, when um, these kinds of small groups and bands fell into disuse in the late 1800s, that's when the denomination really lost its spiritual uh, strength. There you go. And, um, you know, it, it, there's a difference between studying the Bible for knowledge yes, and yes. studying the Bible to be transformed. Yes, good point. And um, I think a lot of small groups, people learn about the Bible, mm -hmm. but it really doesn't impact them. And, um, you know, the, the home group that I lead, you know, we really focus on uh, we're learning about things in the Bible or, you know, in a book that we study in, on yeah. prayer or whatever. But we're, our, the basic thrust of what we're learning is how is this changing our lives? How yes. is this transforming our prayer life? How is this transforming the way that we interact with our family? How is this changing the fact that uh, the way that we interact with our coworkers, things mm -hmm. like that? Yep. So it's, it's, it's not about, um, information it's about application and yes. transformation yes and i think the the thing about the bands of uh, when you have a few guys a few sisters together it, it can go deeper in terms of not only talking about application which is so good obviously and 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 
really putting meat to the kind of skeletal frame of our of our spiritual person but but also we can and we should be talking about those hindrances that that whatever they may be there should be nothing that's off the table in in putting it out there for prayer and for direction and for others other walking partners to know and 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 go with us on this journey and i think that's where the bands also add another um layer of benefit outside of um, traditional small groups, which I'm all for. I love that. And I'm all for men's groups. I'm all for women's groups, but it's, we tend to be able to go deeper and pull up those more shameful, difficult, challenging places in that band of brothers and band of sisters. And isn't it interesting that while lots of churches have men's groups, women's groups, small groups, almost none of them have that deeper layer of the band of brothers and and sisters that where these more difficult, shameful, shameful places can can really be brought up and um, administered to. So I think that really is an Achilles heel of of the church, and we're we're just missing that deeper potential for growth and transformation, as you talked about. One of the things, Tom, you mentioned early on that I wanted to. I'm glad you brought it back up again. Is the word holiness? I mean, I think, and we're living in a time when that word holiness seems like such an outdated. Um, puritanical, you know, what do you even, I think people could, could just dismiss it because of, uh, kind of the ancient nature of the, the use of the word. There's nothing, clearly there's nothing wrong with the use of the word, but can you just kind of unpack, you've said some things for sure, but would you just kind of unpack specifically what is Wesleyan doctrine talking about in terms of holiness and, and why does that matter to us today in our current culture? Sure. Well, you know, um, a lot of times when you go to church, people pretend to be something they're not. Yes. Um, when you walk into church on a Sunday morning, a lot of times you look around you and you think, oh, all these people have their lives together. I'm the only one who's messed up. Mm-hmm. I'm the only one who's struggling. I'm the only one who has problems. Um, because everybody puts on this fake act yep. of how perfect they are and you know how good everything is. Um, and... and um, the idea is that we need to get beyond that. And of course, in a large gathering on a Sunday morning, you can't do that. Right. Um, the only way that you can really get past that, that facade is by knowing somebody in a personal, relational way. And that's where small groups come in. So you get to know people and love and care about people uh, in that environment. And the, the, the whole concept of holiness is um, really to be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul said, be imitators of Christ. Um, And that's that's what we're to be. Or the word Christian means little Christ. So we're we're supposed to be Jesus in the world, um, the physical manifestation of Jesus, at least. And and in order to do that, we can't continue to live in uh, worldly, uh, priorities. We can't continue to be dominated by sin. Yes, we do sin at times, but but that can't be the dominant feature mm-hmm. of our lives. Um, so so holiness simply means growing to be more like Jesus, and and it is a, a process. It's not a it's not a light switch that you flip, and uh, it's something that takes a long time. Um, Eugene Peterson had a book called. Um, uh, consistent obedience in a long direction or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the whole idea that, that we, by daily little acts of obedience to Christ, we become more and more like him. And that means more and more holy. Now, the the reason it has a bad connotation is some people start to take pride in their holiness and say, (laughs) you know, I'm holier than you are. And I'm, you know, I don't have that problem, so you know you're 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 lesser than I am, and obviously they've already missed the point at that point because right. uh, holiness is manifested in humility. But um, but the idea is that that we want to become like Jesus, and um, with His help, by His grace, by the Holy Spirit's power, we can do it, um, and that's really the the um, the. Um, kind of the capstone of Wesleyan understanding of holiness is that we have the possibility of living holy lives in this life. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait till heaven to be transformed. We can be transformed in the here and now. And, um, you know, 
this is sometimes called Christian perfection, which is kind of com communicates a, a mistaken understanding. But really what it means is being able to love and be motivated by love in all we do and in all we think. And um, when we, we do that, we do it as Christ loved us. So we are called to love one another. Mm -hmm. And we love God with our heart, all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And our, when our lives are motivated by love and filled with love, then we are exhibiting Christ to the world. And so yeah. that's, that's what holiness is all about. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think I think another word that that I've heard used uh, quite a bit in, that I think would be synonymous would be or a phrase would be entire sanctification. Is mm -hmm. that yep? Yeah. And I, what I love about what you're sharing and what I've learned more from Wesleyan doctrine around this particular topic is where we we might bristle. You know, people that, that maybe don't come out of uh, uh, Wesleyan doctrine. And don't understand, or maybe they do, but they've not really understood what the teachings are around sanctification and and holiness. It is again just kind of dismissing them because they're they're either prudish or they're unrealistic. And and I love how you just unpacked it that this idea of leaning in and and believing that that our lives can be transformed in this life. Like I grew up pretty much believing and. I, I don't know that anybody ever said this to me. I don't know that I heard a message on it that would have communicated this kind of low view of salvation. But the what I understood to be true about salvation is basically we, we're receiving Jesus now, and now I'm I'm merely a sinner saved by grace, and I'm waiting to be uh, to die, and and then and then kind of life begins at that point in a sense. And that's a that's a gross minimization of what, but but there was something that settled into me, and I've talked to so many others that have had that same sense. They've not recognized that there's a metamorphosis that happens to us at salvation. That when when Paul teaches in Corinthians that that um, we have we are a new creation. That, that that old things have passed away, all things have become new. That feels so unrealistic to so many of us that it, we almost dismiss that verse or just you know, don't spend a lot of time really leaning into it, but we, we miss this richness of uh, Christian theology, frankly, that, um, that there's a way that, that Jesus died in our agreement and alignment and our surrender to him, uh, in, in, in accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior is that that breaks the power of sin in my life today. That the, the, now I may still engage. I may even do some horrendous things as a as a carnal Christian or somebody getting caught up in in some some craziness or whatever. But but a true believer who's off in the weeds as I once was is miserable because they are a new creation living like their old them their old self. But we also the the reality that we don't have to stay in that place that that we we do have the ability now by the infilling of the Holy Spirit by that finished work of Jesus on the cross we do have the ability now to really lean into this sanctification process that we can become more and more like Christ over the course of our lifetime and it's a beautiful thing to lean into that it's not this it it's it's not just this rigid it's not this finger wagging. Um, Kind of self righteousness that I think people often equate it with. It's something rich and beautiful. <clears throat> I think when you were talking earlier, Tom, I think of um, the 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 word peace and the Hebrew word for that of being um, shalom, and and that that word being this idea of of there being a. A, a, a way in which the kingdom of God, the life of God, the life of Christ permeates everything around us. The entire, uh, the entirety of our lives, our homes, ult ultimately our neighborhoods, and our our cities and our culture. I mean, this is this is the kind of way that God wants to work the kingdom of God, like yeast, into and expand the kingdom of God. But this idea of shalom. I mean, don't we all? long for that kind of peace, that kind of rest, that kind of sense of safety, that sense of well-being and wholeness. And I, I think that that does in some way, I, I want, I really want you to speak to this. I feel like even though that's talking about shalom and peace, and we, we could easily separate that in a sense from sanctification and um, holiness, I think those things are really connected in a way that we've not often thought of them historically. Oh, sure. I, I think uh, another way that holiness kind of has gotten uh, off track is that it's been reduced to a set of rules. Yes, that's right. Um, 
you know, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go <laughs> with girls who do, yeah, that's you right. know? So, yep. but, uh, and, and as long as you check off the rules, I'm not doing these things, right. then I'm holy, right? Well, that, that just, again, misses the whole point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not so much measured by um, checking off rules. It's, it's our, what is our heart like? And yeah. if, you, if you read the Gospels, Jesus focused on the heart. He focused on what our motivations are and where, where our heart is. You know, and he said, where your heart is, there will your treasure be. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's the, the, the keeping of the rules happens as a natural byproduct of the changing of our heart. And if we focus only on the keeping of the rules, that's kind of an external, superficial kind of holiness. Yep. But it doesn't get to the real me. And so, so we need um, that, as some people have called it, a heart transplant. You know, we need, we need a new heart. And uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah both talk about that in yes. the Old Testament, getting a new heart, a new heart for God. Mm-hmm. And out of that new heart comes a new way of lo- living life. Um, and, and that's, again, what holiness is all about, is that, that living a new life with God and from the inside out, not the outside in. Right. You can't change the heart by changing that what activities you do or don't do. Mm-hmm. It's it's an inner transformation. Yep. Are there uh, that's so good? And are there any other thoughts, Tom? As we kind of, uh, I have a couple of things I just want to run by you, but or or share with our audience. But are there any other thoughts that you've felt either coming into this or maybe something that's come up in the conversation? that uh, is, is kind of on the forefront of your thinking that you'd like to share with our audience, um, either about the GMC or transforming congregations or any of that? Well, I think the biggest barrier to the transforming congregations type of ministry is people's reluctance to talk about issues of sexuality. Yep. And I, I think it comes from uh, shame because we all have, uh, many of us have uh, areas of shame around that. Mm-hmm. It also comes from the the whole um, propaganda from the progressive viewpoint that says you have to accept any sexual behavior between any people who want it, and that it's not you know if you don't you're you're kind of some kind of luddite who mm-hmm. is you know a dinosaur from the past, and so it's intimidating people from talking about sexuality. And the other thing is, you know, we need to focus on the positive, God's positive plan and purpose behind sex rather than or in addition to and and over and above. uh, Just don't do this. Don't do that. It's 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 about far more than what kinds of relationships are harmful. It's also about what kind of relationship does God desire for us within a sexual relationship and what does that look like? What's the purpose of sex anyway? Mm -hmm. Um, And all of that, I think, and and that's where I think you do a great job of of portraying that positive image of of sexuality. And that's really the key. Mm -hmm. I think churches have failed. Um, The reason we have the sexual revolution and we have it continuing into today is that the churches have failed to teach people God's plan for human sexuality. Yeah. And so I would urge pastors and lay people to um, become equipped in that understanding of God's purpose for sexuality and teach it from a positive standpoint, not just what to avoid, but what is God's whole purpose? Mm-hmm. Because once you understand the purpose, then it makes much more sense why yes. to avoid certain things. Yes. And um, so, so I guess approaching um, sexuality proactively uh, preaching on it, teaching it, um, is is a key aspect of helping people in the midst of this hypersexualized culture that we live in. That's great. Yeah, I love how you said that. Another, another, uh, I, I've. I want to say of lesser value, and but it, it does kind of go along with what you're sharing here is one of the other kind of roadblocks to a ministry like ours is that the um, even the the support. So you guys have, when I go out and I do work on behalf of transforming congregations or we have expenses, you know, related to 
transforming congregations in in um, Methodism, Wesleyanism, then you know we we have traditionally for the practically nine years I've been working. Uh, for you and for good news, you guys reimburse that back to Love and Truth Network. But you've always there's there's always been some support of transforming congregations that's come directly to good news, and and that's been earmarked for good news or for transforming congregations. But every month, good news has had to um, uh, kind of chip in and 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 be able to reimburse some of those expenses. And so I know as as we've we're now spinning off transforming congregations to come under Love and Truth Network. Good News has been so gracious to um, to encourage their supporters that have been supporting you for, for many of them for many years and decades to shift their support over to transforming congregations. And, and so we're so grateful you know, for, for you guys advocating in that way. And I would just say to, you know, to those who are listening or viewing our main thing, first of all, we don't expect people to, to, to support transforming congregations or love and truth network until you've had a chance to check us out, kick the tires, see what we're about, get on our websites and, and see what the ministries are about, what we're supporting and, and, and how we do ministry for the church, how we're equipping the church. We don't believe that, um, parachurch ministry is really, Really, God's plan A. We we believe what we know is we're called to strengthen pastors and leaders and and churches to do the work of ministry in these core areas that people are wrestling with, both within the church and in your local community. So uh, we do need the um, the prayer support for sure. I know that we have been protected uh, from the enemy's attack in ways that we don't even know uh, because it, we just haven't experienced. We've experienced some, but I think God has absolutely used the prayers of His saints covering us as a ministry to provide that protection and then has also has also come alongside of us financially but for those that do believe in the work that we're doing and um and those that have been supporting good news we would just again encourage uh that that transfer of of some of that support into helping transforming congregations be strong and expand into other uh wesleyan denominations as well well, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about transferring congregations is the burden that you have to equip the church. I mean, as you stated, that's the primary focus of your work. Yeah. It's to get the church up to speed. A lot of pastors don't preach or teach on these issues because they aren't equipped. Mm -hmm. And so you're there to help equip them. Uh, you're there to break the ice and help the conversation get started in a congregation. You're there to provide guidelines for how ministry can happen. And, um, you know, I've, I've read so many glowing reviews from churches have experienced uh, your ministry and the work that you do with them to help them and be equipped. And I would say to people, you know, if you believe in the rightness of uh, what we stand for in terms of boundaries around sexuality, then support transforming congregations because mm -hmm. Transforming Congregations is advocating for those boundaries, but in a way that leads to transformation personally and within congregations and holiness and wholeness and shalom, peace, what you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier. I mean, that's the goal of all of this. And it's, um, it's really an essential ministry. We can't just stand on sidelines and say, what you guys are doing is wrong, stop it. We have to be there for ministry to help people overcome the brokenness that we experience in in our society today and and so transforming congregations needs your kind of support well thanks tom i really appreciate you sharing that <clears throat> and just being with us for this uh podcast episode appreciate your time my pleasure to be here thanks for inviting me Absolutely. Well, hey, everybody. I hope this has been an informative time of uh, our podcast episode here with Tom Lambrick. We're so grateful for you for tuning in, whether you're coming again through Love and Truth Network or through a connection to Transforming Congregations. We hope that you'll join us again for a future podcast. We so appreciate the time you've just invested with us in our Transforming Congregations podcast. To join us for future podcasts, dial into transformingcongregations.org slash podcast, and we look forward to seeing you in a future podcast.